in the hit TV show Frasier, the character of Niles' wife, Maris, is never shown on screen. She is an enigma, an unanswered question. Throughout the entirety of Frasier, she is never shown. And as an audience member, you want to see her. You want her to come through the door. You want someone to finally embody this character that's mystified you for so long. But no one ever does. She remains just around the corner, behind the shower curtain, just out of shot. The creators of Frasier limit what the audience see, never letting us see her, and therefore invoking this imaginative response to this character, forcing us to imagine for ourselves what we think Maris looks like. Now, why do I think this is important? Because we live in an age where the majority of us right now have access to the internet via our phone or laptop, and therefore have access to an insurmountable amount of answers. There's not many questions that you can enter into Google that you won't get a reasonable answer for. But there's no code, there's no question, there's no phrase, there's no words you can put into Google that will sum up and give you the image of Maris. She remains a question mark, something we are forced to imagine for ourselves. And this happens a lot in art. In one of my favorite plays by Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire, Tennessee Williams limits what the audience sees by the setting. So whatever happens off stage, we don't see. So when Blanche and Stanley leave the stage, we want to follow them. We want to see where they go, what they say to each other. But we can't. Tennessee Williams limits what we see and therefore forces us to imagine for ourselves. In one of the greatest novels of the 20th century, The Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald makes the narrator Nick Carraway instead of the title character, Jay Gatsby. So in the pivotal scenes between Jay Gatsby and his love interest, Daisy, when they go into the room on their own after years of wanting each other, we want to follow them. We want to see what they say to each other, but we can't because Nick, the narrator, isn't in the room with them. Whatever Nick doesn't see, we don't see. And I found this absence of answers in art inspiring. And the th key thing about these examples is that the artist takes away the power from the audience. We, as the audience and the reader, have no power over what they tell us and what they don't tell us. And what they don't tell us forces us to be creative with our response to the art. And I thought about this in a practical way, how I could use this limitation in how I experience other types of art. And I started to think about how we experience paintings. When we go to an art gallery, the paintings tend to be on a white background, hanged up next to a plaque. A plaque giving the information about the artist, the date it was made, what's the title of it, why it was made, what's the meaning behind it. And other than being educational, I think these plaques almost give too much information. They overcast your initial judgment of the painting. Whatever you originally thought of that painting is now changed because of the title, or because of the context, or because you, what you know happened at that time. Thinking about this, I showed my friends this painting. I asked them what they thought about it, what the meaning was behind it, what they saw in the painting. Some of them said that they saw buildings, some said they saw squares, some said they just saw a puddle or just mud. Some were confused and didn't know what I was asking. But then when I told them the title, Man with Guitar and the Date, and the artist Pablo Picasso, all of a sudden they started to see aspects of a face, characteristics of a guitar. From their previously varied responses to the art, all of a sudden they had this one-size-fits-all response to it. They started to see very similarly what each other thought as if believing that what they should see was what the title suggested, rather than their previous initial response. Now, as an English student, I wanted to see if an author had ever done this, practically, if an author had ever limited how they made something and how they produced the art, whether they varied their art choice or whether they varied their word choice. And I came across this book, Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. 
one of the most timeless childhood stories of the 20th century. Now, this book only contains 50 words. Now, if you've read it, you probably think it likely. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of rhyme. But what Dr. Seuss does here, by limiting his creative output, limiting the words he uses, he creates one of the most successful childhood stories. So much so that it influenced a hypothesis in 2016 called the Green Eggs and Ham Hypothesis. How Constraints Facilitate Creativity by Catronel Hort Trump. Now, this was conducted in Riders University in America. And the study took 64 undergraduate students and it split them into two groups. And they were tasked with writing a rhyme that would go inside a greeting card, like a happy birthday or a get well soon. And group A was tasked with writing a rhyme, however, they were told that they needed to include a certain amount of nouns and a certain amount of words. That was their constraint. In group B, however, they were given no constraint. They could write whatever they wanted as long as it was something to do with happy birthday. And what they found was what they expected. They expected that group A would create more imaginative, more memorable responses to the prompts. For example, in group B, someone came up with happy birthday to you all, I hope you have a ball. Whereas group A arguably made a more, more creative response by saying, Today was the day you left the womb, one day closer to the tomb. Arguably a much better response and a much better insight into what a birthday is. In the second study they did, they wanted to see if self-imposed constraints worked in the same way. So if you could consciously limit yourself and still have this creative output. And they again found the same results that the group with the constraints made the better and more creative and more memorable responses to the rhymes. And Hort Trump concluded that the search may be tougher, but it is ultimately worthwhile when persistence pays off. In the end, constraints may turn out to be liberating. Now, I'm an English student, but I have done art most of my life. But I found that when I came to uni, I wasn't inspired, I wasn't motivated maybe to finish the art I was making. So I decided I was going to put this into practice. I was going to limit my creative output and see if it made me create more art. So I gave myself some rules on the drawings I was going to do. I decided I was only going to use one pen. I was only going to draw faces, which wasn't that hard. And I was also only going to draw the black aspects of a picture. So not the gray, not the almost black, just the black. And what I started to produce were these weird, abstract portraits that featured only the minimal aspects of a face. It was a type of art that I'd never done before. I wasn't necessarily comfortable with it. I'd used to been doing oil paintings and sketches. And as I got more into it, I got more inspired. I found out that I was looking at art in a different way. When I gave myself this obstacle to overcome, I became more inspired. And I started to see different pictures, pictures with some of my favorite artists in. And I started to see them differently. I started to exaggerate the black aspects. I started to see things in a more novel, creative way than I had if I had no limitations. After I finished that project, I started on another one. And this time, I, would, I wanted to look at the art, not in how I saw it, but how I was going to draw it. So I thought about the techniques I would use. Now, if you've ever done art, you know there's different ways of shading. There's cross-hatching or stippling. I decided that I was going to draw in little lines that were going to accumulate to suggest a face. And this was the limitation I gave myself. And I found that when I saw the paintings and saw the pictures I was going to draw, I started to look at them differently. It was as if my mind changed as to what I needed to see, and I started creating these line drawings. And what happened, I believe, is that when I had an obstacle in front of me, it made me see the things I wanted to create differently. So when I asked the question why Maris should never be seen, it's because if there was a reboot of Frasier, and Maris did walk through the door, we would all have the same Maris. Previously, we had different ones that we'd imagined in our heads. If we saw where Stanley went and what Daisy did behind closed doors, we would all have the same interpretation. 
So we have to ask ourselves whether the answers are always what we want, or whether that creative endeavor that we go on when there's an absence is better, makes us work harder. Because how are we to imagine anything if the information is always provided for us? It's as if we need something to limit us. It's as if in order to first think out the box, you first need a box. Thank you.